Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Concerned Ontario Doctors COVID-19 panel. My name is Dr. Colvinder Cargill. I'm the president and co-founder of Concerned Ontario Doctors and a frontline physician in the greater Toronto area. I am honored um, to be joined by world eminent scientists and, and um, o physicians today to discuss the harms of the lockdowns, the dangers of censorship and a path forward. Joining us today are three esteemed panelists who are giants in their field and who are the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, which has garnered nearly 1 million um, signatures from physicians, scientists, public health experts, and concerned citizens globally. First, we have Dr. Jay Obarcharya, who is a professor of medicine at Stanford um, University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He directs Stanford Center for Demography and Economics of Health and Aging. Dr. Bhattacharya's recent research focuses on the epidemiology of COVID, including oh, the fatality of COVID infection and the effects of the lockdown policies. Before COVID, Dr. Bhattacharya studied the health and the well being of the vulnerable populations with an emphasis on the role of government programs, biomedical innovation, and health policy. He has published many articles in top peer reviewed scientific journals in medicine, economics, health policy, epidemiology, stats, law, and public health, amongst other fields. He holds both an MD and a PhD in, in economics, both earned at the Stanford o University. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We also have um, on the panel, Dr. Martin Okoldroff, um, who is a epidemiologist, a biostatistician, and a professor of o medicine at the Harvard o Medical School. His research centers on developing and applying new disease surveillance methods for the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks and for post-market drug and vaccine safety of surveillance. The methods are used by most federal, state and provincial public health agencies around the world and by many local public health departments and hospital epidemiologists. Thank you so much for joining us. And we have last on the panel, Dr. Osinitra Gupta, who's a professor of theoretical epidemiology at the University of Oxford, with an interest in infectious disease agents that are responsible for malaria, HIV, influenza, and bacterial meningitis. Dr. Gupta has consolidated a large body of work on the evolution of pathogen population structure which establishes a novel pipeline for developing a universal influenza of vaccine. In tandem with her studies of pathogen diversity, Dr. Gupta has made fundamental contributions to the evolution of diversity in host genes that protect against infectious disease. Thank you so much for our esteemed panelists for joining us today. Uh, moderating today is um, Dr. Richard Shavas, who is a retired Ontario physician with specialty oh, um, training in public health and, and internal medicine. He was Ontario's former chief medical officer of health for, for um, a, um, oh, 10 years, spanning from 1987 to 1997. He actually trained our current um, uh, chief public health officer here in Ontario, Dr. Williams, and oh, many other medical officers of health. Dr. Shabus was also the former chief of staff at the York Central Hospital during SARS. He was critical of, of the mass quarantine during the SARS uh, outbreak and the alarmist of predictions surrounding H5N1 bird flu. He has been outspoken against the lockdown since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, highlighting the tremendous harms to society. Thank you all for joining us today. And the floor is yours, Dr. Shabus. Well, thank you, and, and, and thank you, Colvinder, for, for organizing this. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm, I'm, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, you've, uh, you've faced uh, efforts at censorship by our, our, our medical licensing body in Ontario, and it, it's wonderful to see that you're not being intimidated by that. One of the, the great casualties of COVID has been the, the, the loss of, of collegial constructive discussion. And uh, that's why I think this panel is, is, is so important. So uh, to our, our distinguished guests, first of all, welcome to Canada, at least, at least virtually. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, included uh, in this. I've, uh, I, I, I will say that I have found the, uh, the last year to be a, a very um, 
from an intellectual and, and professional standpoint, a very isolating experience. I've had a handful of supportive colleagues, but I have felt very much cut off from the mainstream of discussion in, in, in professional and scientific uh, world and, and from the media where I've been uh, effectively, uh, effectively canceled. And it's been great whenever I have seen one of the three of you give an interview or read something you've written because it tells me that I'm actually not crazy, uh, that, that, that my idea is, well, I may not be right about everything or anything, it's not crazy and that these are legitimate perspectives, these are legitimate questions. And so I'd like to thank the panelists for their, uh, their, their, their ongoing insights, uh, for their willingness to speak out and for their courage, because I'm sure whatever animosity I have faced, uh, you have faced at uh, orders of magnitude higher. So anyway, we have lots to talk about. We have uh, about, uh, about an hour and a half, so let's get right to it. Um, I'm hoping that most of the people who see this video will be familiar with the Great Barrington Declaration, which I signed uh, way back in October, and uh, many of us have signed, and that's great. But I wonder if we could begin just by asking the panelists to go over what they see as the fundamental principles of the Great Barrington Declaration. And in particular, it's, it's six months later, uh, and there have been important developments in COVID. I would, I would particularly highlight uh, the vaccines and the variants. So, what are the principles and where does it sit at the end of March uh, 2021? Maybe if we could start with you, Jay. Sure. So the, the, there's two key scientific ideas to my mind that, that underlie the prevention declaration. The first is that there's an enormous risk difference by age in uh, mortality from COVID. The oldest population, people who are the oldest face the highest risk by far. So just to give some sense, from uh, seroprevalence studies around the world, uh, the, the, the risk of survival, the survival probability for someone over 70 is, is 95% from infection, which is, I mean, that's a really high death rate from a disease. Whereas for people under 70, it's much higher, 99.95%. And for children, the, the flu poses a greater threat than COVID. There's this enormous age stratification in the risk of, of severe outcomes from COVID. The second, idea, the second scientific idea, uh, is, is that the lockdowns themselves, by causing disruptions in the normal functioning society, pose great harm directly to the population. Not just in terms of economics, which I think has sort of unfortunately been emphasized to some extent, it's really mainly in terms of the, the health and psychological well-being of the population at large. The, the, the lockdowns are not uh, a human way to live. They separate people, they, they disrupt our ability to interact with one another in, in ways that, uh, that are harmful to human, human well-being. Uh, so if you combine those ideas, the, the, for, the, for the oldest populations, we have to do a, a, an enormous amount to protect them from COVID, right? So that's the first idea of the, the Great Barrington Declaration, focus protection of the vulnerable, the older, older population. For the rest of the population, the lockdowns are more harmful than COVID. The, the, so, so the argument for the, from the Great Parenting Declaration side is to lift the lockdowns and instead focus on uh, and, and think about creative ways to protect the vulnerable. Um, to, 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 uh, and we, in the Great Parenting Declaration, laid out a whole bunch of ideas for how, to, how one might do that. But of course, and we invited the public health community to join with us in thinking of ways to, to better protect the vulnerable without the lockdowns. Um, I, I suppose we'll talk a lot about, about how, how the lockdowns have failed. So I won't, I'll leave that aside um, for now, but I'll just say that the, 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 the vaccines provide a perfect way to, I mean, a, a great way to protect the vulnerable. By prioritizing older people for the vaccines, you effectively turn the, the, you defang the epidemic, take away the, the, the possibility of the, of the epidemic harming the people that it's most likely to affect by effectively vaccinating them first. Thank you. Uh, Sunitra, would you like to add to that? Um, so indeed, so um, Jay's laid out the, the pre basic precepts and vaccination indeed actually allows us to get away from the argument. Um, actually, it might be useful at this stage to visit, revisit the arguments that were raised at the time and to see how well they've weathered or, or you know, what, what has happened in the last six months with regard to the arguments that were raised against this idea. Uh, one was that there may be no immunity at all 
to um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it was positive that it was too, it was premature to assume that. Now, I would argue that it was, if any, anything is possible, but in terms of likelihood of there being acquired immunity, first of all, there were already studies, very, very elegant and very well conducted studies around showing that you made the type and array of responses, antibody and T cell, that you would expect of COVID, of a, a coronavirus. I mean, the truth is we weren't completely in the dark about this virus. We had ample knowledge of what other coronaviruses did by way of eliciting uh, natural immunity. So six months down the line uh, later, we, I think we can say now with confidence that that was not a very good way to uh, attack the idea. I mean, why you'd want to attack it in the first place, another whole story. Then the second line of attack, which was a little bit more reasonable, was that natural immunity was unlikely to be lifelong, as it is measles. And that, that actually was sensible, uh, reasonable um, uh, hypothesis in that that is true of many of the other coronaviruses. But what was wrong there in the thinking was that because natural immunity was not lifelong, we, could, we would never get to a kind of state of endemic equilibrium uh, where by herd immunity reduced the risk of infection to tolerable levels in the population. Now, once again, with reference to other coronaviruses, that is exactly what happens, that you reach a state, an endemic state, in which people are, sufficient numbers of people are immune to keep infection levels at something we can manage. And that is bound to be true for um, SARS-CoV-2, because while uh, we do not become immune forever in the sense of we don't develop lifelong infection blocking immunity, uh, you can maintain herd immunity. In fact, it's maintained at exactly the same level for, a pop, uh, for another any other pathogen with the same R0 um, through a slightly different mechanism whereby immunity is lost but regained. So you just have this much more dynamical flow, but actually the levels of immunity that you achieve in that way are identical to a system where immunity is lifelong. So loss of immunity does not actually impact on the proposition that we our destination is one of endemic equilibrium. Uh, and that's a fundamental epidemiological fallacy that I am surprised that many people made. And the third point of criticism was that you cannot deliver focused protection. As um, Dr. Matachari has just said, that it's unfortunate that this was just, you know, treated as dogma because, you know, what we wanted at the very least was just a conversation with other public health um, uh, practitioners. But anyway, that never became, that debate was never had, which is sad. But the truth is the vaccine now uh, provides us a way of shelving that debate. Let's, although perhaps we should keep it somewhere and no, shouldn't shelve it too far back because it might come up again. Um, in, if we are to have a robust strategy for how we deal with these situations. But so delivering focus protection has got a whole lot easier. And as far as I'm concerned, we in the UK have just done that. We have, we've got there, you know, mission accomplished on that one. So um, what is a mystery is why we are now not opening up. Martin. Yeah, so, uh... Uh, there has been a very naive belief among politicians, journalists, and some scientists that somehow we can um, uh, suppress this disease with lockdowns and contact tracing and so on and protect the old and vulnerable that way. And that's uh, as soon as we had the outbreaks a year ago in Italy and Iran, it was very clear this pandemic would be worldwide. And once it's in the country, uh, that is an impossible thing to do. Uh, and we saw that uh, 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 there were those who believed that when the cases went down in the summer, that that was because of successful lockdown measures. And that's why in October, we decided to write this declaration uh, 
because we knew that things were going to come back uh, this coming winter. We didn't know exactly to the extent of it, but we knew it was going to come back. And at the time, we were criticized for doing a straw man because nobody wanted lockdowns, but it only took a few weeks when people were starting to uh, to uh, argue for lockdowns again. And the problem is there are two bad ways to deal with the pandemic, and there's one good way to do it. But the one bad way is to let it rip and not do anything and just uh, uh, let everybody Everybody, uh, everybody can get infected, old and young, and so on. And if you do that, a lot of old will be affected. And uh, uh, since they are high risk of dying from this disease, a lot of people will have high mortality. And everybody can get infected. So it's, the risk is not, it's not the difference in risk of getting infected. It's the difference in risk of, of dying or having a serious uh, hospitalization. So, uh, to, so let it rip is a very bad strategy. But lockdown is also a very bad strategy because it doesn't, uh, uh, put, it just sort of slows things down. And there's some argument of doing that in the very beginning to not overwhelm the hospital system so that everybody doesn't get sick at the same time. But to do it for a long period of time is very misguided and uh, actually increases the death from uh, COVID. Uh, because uh, uh, the more you drag it out, the more difficult it is for older people to protect themselves. Uh, so basically, lockdown is a let it rip strategy that's dragged out a little bit more over time. So if we look at basic, basic principles of public health and all the pandemic, uh, pandemic preparedness plans that uh, most countries had done before the pandemic, uh, it is to you protect the most vulnerable, the higher risk people. And in this case, it's the older people. So that's what the Great Barrington Declaration put forward. We have to do a much, much better job protecting older people because lockdowns do not protect them at all. And we have seen that we have had enormous mortality from uh, this pandemic that uh, because lockdown is a very bad strategy. So, uh, and, and there are standard uh, ways to protect uh, older people. For example, in nursing homes, you don't have, you should have less staff rotation and more testing of the personnel, et cetera. So there are standard uh, ways that we outline either in the declaration itself or in the FAQ that goes with it that should have been implemented and that weren't implemented and that has led to tragic uh, results with far too many people dying from uh, this disease than had to be the case. And then, of course, for the younger people, uh, they are not at high risk of, of uh, COVID. Uh, as Jay said, for children, the risk is less than from the annual influenza. And we don't close schools for the annual influenza and so on. So we have done the misguided things of trying to protect people who don't need protection while not protecting the ones who do need protection. Um, children and young adults, they have suffered a lot of the collateral damage uh, from this, this uh, from these lockdowns, uh, uh, with school closings and uh, plummeting vaccination rates, uh, cancer screenings not being done, uh, worse cardiovascular disease outcomes, people not getting their diabetes treatments, uh, more overdoses, uh, uh, opioid overdoses, and. Uh, uh, deteriorating mental health. Uh, so this has been an absolutely catastrophic public health disaster and fiasco uh, of how uh, we have responded to this pandemic. And uh, I hope it will never ever be done again. And uh, we need to now end the lockdowns. And what's happening now is we had the, the new surge in the winter. So we have a lot more immunity now uh, so the reason that things are going down is mostly now because we have immunity in large uh, sections of the population, which is helped by uh, uh, more and more people getting vaccinated also. And eventually, as we go a little bit further, the seasonal pattern is going to kick in. So that will also help us uh, to lower the, uh, the mortality during the, the, the spring and the summer. Well, thank you. And, and just to give that a little bit of a, a Canadian uh, perspective, um, in, in the province of Ontario, for example, in the outbreak last spring, uh, about 75% of all the deaths in the province were in long-term care residents. Uh, in the outbreak in the winter, uh, 
uh, that was down to about 50%. So there were, it wasn't far from perfect, but, but, but the measures were somewhat effective. And we, of course, I think quite reasonably immunized long-term care residents as a priority. And when I looked at the numbers yesterday, and we're still getting an average of 24 deaths a day in the province of Ontario, there were no deaths in long-term care. So, yeah, and, and, and the, the, the reported case fatality rate in the province, which you could estimate from the global from the from the, the general numbers, was running about two percent uh, at the peak of the winter outbreak, the middle of January. It's now running at about one percent. So that's you take away the fifty percent of the deaths in long term care, which we appear to have done, and 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 that's the result you get. On the other hand. Um, Canada in general and has had has had relatively low rates of infection and certainly low rates of death compared, for example, to the United States and and compared to to Western Europe. I'm I'm not quite sure why uh, we can we can talk and speculate about that. Uh, I'm 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 a little loath to attribute it to our lockdown measures because they really haven't been very different than anywhere else. In fact, maybe even a little less severe than in, in many places. And we've had a huge variation within the country, so we've had much higher higher rates in the province of Quebec, particularly the island of Montreal, which are at, at Western European levels, uh, and, and lower rates in Ontario, about half the rate in Ontario, and, and, and half again or, or less in British Columbia, without any real indication that anybody has done uh, anything uh, particularly uh, different. But the result of that is that we probably have fairly low levels of natural immunity in, in, our, in, in Canada. And we're starting to see the kind of uptick in cases that, that uh, has, been, has been seen in a lot of other places in the world now, uh, which uh, presumably is, is, uh, is due to the spread of, of what the next thing I want you to talk about, which is the impact of the variants. Uh, what do you think the impact of the variance is and how do you how does that change or does it change uh, the Great Barrington uh, perspective? Can I start again with you, Jay? Sure. Uh, so the variance, uh, actually, you might want to tap uh, Dr. Gupta because she is uh, the world's expert in this. But um, I'll just to give you my view, much of which I've learned from her. Um, the the the, uh, the variants uh, are uh, sort of what you would expect when um, the, the the disease has reached a, a sort of endemic equilibrium, or close to an endemic equilibrium. The the the, the variants, uh, you know, the, this disease mutates all the time. There's tens of thousands of more variant variants, all, and most of them uh, do nothing to the infectivity of the disease or lethality of the disease. Um, the, the variants that have emerged, uh, the empirical evidence that I've read to date su suggests that they may be uh, uh, slightly more infectious than the, the wild type variant, of uh, the wild type virus, um, but, uh, and, and very, very mildly more, uh, more uh, uh, lethal with a very small, but, but with no, no change in the fundamental thing, which is the age gradient and more lethality. The, both the variants and the wild type both share that same thing, which is that it's much more deadly in the old than in the young. Uh, and the other key feature for policy for the variant is that uh, infection with the wild type vir virus and also, uh, also vaccination seems to provide protection against serious outcomes from the variants. That is, um, while the variants May, uh, may, may you might get reinfected with the variants, it's possible, so just like you might get reinfected with the wild type. Um, the, the, the sec the, when you're reinfected, the outcome is going to, is very likely to be milder than the initial infection and certainly much less likely to produce a death or hospitalization. So in that sense, the variants don't change the policy calculus at all. The lockdowns, if you thought that the, that the lockdowns were going to be effective against the less infectious wild type virus, I don't see why you would expect it to be more effective against a more infectious variant. Um, so, in, so I think uh, the use of the variant to raise fear in the population is just a mistake, both from the scientific perspective and the sci uh, pu public health perspective. Um, you, you, the variants are not cause for uh, renewing the lockdown or, or shot because what's the end point again like the end point is not elimination of a virus that's even more infectious um, and the lockdowns if we continue to do them will continue to 
wreak enormous harm on society. The right strategy is still focused protection. Sunitra? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I don't think it materially alters um, anything, any of the recommendations that were made at all. I suppose it's not as if we, I mean, we would alter our recommendations. It's, it's not, we're not sticking necessarily to a set of recommendations, but the general principle that you protect the vulnerable and that's really all you need to do um, remains under what Jay just, just described, which is exactly um, as I believe um, is the right interpretation of the situation, which is that within any kind of standard evolutionary theory, um, any model would um, indicate that the likelihood is that these variants, and it's not, I mean, it's interesting that the same mutations have cropped up in different parts of the world. So here's a pathogen population that is trying to optimize its ability to infect people, optimize its virulence, which doesn't mean that it becomes more or less virulent, but just finds the just the right um, level that allows it to compete successfully against other variants. So the prevailing, the main principle here is that these systems evolve towards the um, a state in which the optimal variant dominates. And the optimal variant is one which may be slightly more transmissible, but there is no reason to believe that it is hugely more transmissible. The reason why people are coming up with these ideas goes back to something you said, which is the level of herd immunity. So when there is no herd immunity, the, the lower the level of it, previous exposure, um, the bigger the pool of susceptible individuals the pathogen population has to play with. And so the lower, um, so it faces less competition in a totally susceptible population. As people become immune, the pool available of resources available to the pathogen becomes smaller and smaller, at which point the com competition intensifies. And this is probably what's happened, leading in many parts of the world to the emergence of variants which are remarkably similar in lots of ways and likely to be at least a little bit more transmissible, um, but crucially having the same age distribution of risk. The other thing they might be, um, they are very likely to be, is it to have to possess is some level of immune evasion. So there have been very nice studies showing that the South Afri African variant, for example, um, is, is not neutralized to the same extent as the wild type by people who've previously been exposed to the wild type. But that doesn't mean that the vaccines won't work against them or indeed that natural immunity to the previous variant won't protect you against severe disease. So what it, all of this does is it refocuses our attention or it underscores the fact that we need to separate out the process of infection and the observations relating to that, that infections are growing with the process of severe disease and death, because that's what we want to prevent. So if we start reacting every time we see infections grow, if, if, uh, to, if we start imposing restrictions to stop infection in attempt to stop disease and death, then we'll all, we're always going to end up in a muddle. What we need to do is be very clear that what we want to stop is disease and death. And that it's too, it's a very naive attitude to assume that the only way to do that is by curbing infection. And so we need to make that, to get that right in our heads. If we decouple those and the variant situation kind of highlights or, or as I said, underscores the need to do that, then I think we'll be in a better position to, st to prevent the deaths from this virus. Okay, Martin? The only one small thing I have to add is that 
the key thing is this variance. If uh, right now they have the same age distribution in that anybody can be infected, but the risk for mortality for death is still the same, much much higher for the old versus the young. And the only th only type of variance that was sort of changed that is if suddenly we get a variant that's starting killing the young people instead of the old, then we have to fundamentally change uh, the strategy. But that's not the case. Uh, all these variants still have a situation where they are much more dangerous for the old and not at all dangerous for, for the young. Uh, and therefore, uh, the focus protection uh, of, of older high-risk people is still the right strategy. Well, thank you. And it, just, to, just to get a couple of comments, um, I want to come back to something Jay said. It's a kind of a pet peeve of mine, but I, I react negatively to the the, uh, the general use of the word mutation to describe what's going on. As Jay said, this virus mutates all the time. In fact, all living organisms, including all of us, are sitting here merrily mutating away like mad. This is not about mutation. It's about evolution, and the virus is evolving, and more or less in the way that we would expect the virus to evolve, and I think Sunitra's point about it's a reflection of the fact that it's feeling evolution pressure, which is coming from population immunity. So not to be unexpected. I should also comment that, uh, that a couple of days ago uh, in the provincial health officer in British Columbia, Bonnie Henry, who I'm not going to say she's been more sensible than the others, but has been less unsensible perhaps than some of the others, uh, made a comment that she was concerned about the increase in cases with the variants because they, they were happening mainly in young people. And I just found that a complete head scratcher. Maybe she would have been happier if we were seeing more cases in the elderly who are going to die rather than the young who are, as we know, are by and large going to, going to, brush, going to brush this off. So anyway, moving on to a, to a, to a, a related subject. Um, I think it was Martin who, who suggested a few minutes ago that we've never controlled respiratory viruses in this manner before. I'm, you know, they, they can show a few pictures of people in 1918 wearing masks and they shut the schools in some places in the United States for a couple of weeks in 1957, but lockdown as a, as a disease, as a strategy to, to control a respiratory virus is something we've never done before. It was never part of our pandemic planning. And if we reflect back to about a year ago, uh, we went in the matter of a couple of weeks from being fairly relaxed about COVID, I'd say in hindsight, probably too relaxed about COVID, cer certainly I was, to a state of absolute panic, uh, which is when we started instituting lockdowns based on the fact that China locked down and then Italy locked down, so it must be the thing to do. And there were some compelling internet memes that encouraged people to think that lockdown was going to be effective. And then in a, in a, in a kind of a pandemic of, a, a pandemic of its own, in a matter of a couple of weeks, just about everybody uh, rushed in lockdown, including uh, in, including Canada. Uh, and I think there is, the, as we know, the evidentiary basis for this was 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 very very thin on the ground. But we've had experience with it for a year, and I and without dwelling at the moment, we can come back to it on the harms of lockdown. There is still a general perception, I think, out there in the world that number one, we are faced with this sort of microbiological apocalypse that the models predicted a year ago with, with tens of millions of dead, even though I think very clearly that was a gross exaggeration. But there's, a, a, I think, a, still a widespread perception that lockdowns are doing the job of preventing it. They're doing the job of controlling the, the infection. And in Canada, we've gone through a whole series of places that were supposed to be the model for us. Back in the spring, the models were supposed to be Germany that was controlling the disease with contact tracing and the Czech Republic, which was controlling the disease by, by wearing masks. And then we were supposed to follow the lead of Michigan uh, with their lockdown. And then we were told, no, no, France is the place that's, uh, that's controlled things with lockdowns. So my question is, uh, you know, for our audience, do lockdowns actually play, do, are they really effective at controlling the spread of the disease? And if so, how effective are they? And what's sort of the long-term, if any, advantage of lockdown in terms of disease control? Who'd, who'd like to jump in on that? I, I can start. So a year ago, when we started with the lockdowns, that was a huge experiment for which there was no uh, precedent and no uh, studies. So it was a huge experiment and there was no evidence that they would work. 
Uh, now, a uh, year later, we do have the evidence, and the evidence is that they do not, not work. So uh, they, can, uh, they can sort of push things forward a little bit, but uh, with the pandemic, uh, it can never be, uh, be kept out. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this belief uh, that they would work, that uh, lockdowns and uh, masks and contact tracing would work, uh, that has created this uh, big disaster. And uh, uh, a lot of people have died because of it, because it didn't it protect the old. We didn't put in the, the, the measures to protect the old. And even before vaccines, there were many measures that we could have put in that was never used at the same time as we're getting this collateral damage on public health that uh, we're gonna live with and die with for many years to come. Okay, anyone else? The other, the other thing, and this I've learned from from Dr. Kuldor, so I'm 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 stealing directly from him, but he's here, so he can he can he can uh, you know take credit. Um, it, lockdowns are focused protection of the rich. That's the way to think about them, right? They're, it is, they're a form of trickle down epidemiology. If they protected anybody, they protected the rich, um, and uh, you can see this in the the evidence from Toronto that the rich neighborhoods of Toronto have been relatively hit less than the poor neighbors of Toronto. If you think about what lockdowns actually do, it's not universal. Uh, people still need to have food delivered, grown. Um, people still need to have uh, you know, uh, 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 all kinds of services provided. But who can afford to stay at home and have all the services provided for them? It's, it's the relatively well off. Um, whereas the working class has been exposed to the virus exposed in, in and, uh, and, and, and so you see this in places where there's a lockdown, you see this gross inequality in outcomes where it's the poor and working class that have borne the brunt of the disease and borne the epidemiological sort of the, the, the cost for, of, of achieving herd immunity in some sense. Um, in LA County in, Cal in California, where uh, you know, I live, live in California, we've been locked down essentially for a full year with, with schools closed, churches closed, businesses uh, you know, at, at half capacity or less uh, through much of the epidemic. And in LA County, the death rates are three times higher for Hispanics than for whites. And for people living in uh, places like Beverly Hills, high income neighborhoods versus people living in, in, in poor neighborhoods, the, 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 again, the death rate's three times higher from the disease in the poor neighborhoods. Whereas in Florida, for instance, which has not been locked down for most of the epidemic, it's the, the results are much more equal. And in terms of the level, actually Florida has achieved better results in terms of COVID, COVID mortality than, than California after you adjust for the, the older population there. The lockdowns have not worked. And in many ways, it's the, the, the most regressive economic and public health policy I have ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah, I think in the United States, I think the lockdowns is the worst assault on the on workers and the working class since uh, segregation and the Vietnam War. Anitra, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, yes, well, uh, I'm going to quote myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, some time ago, I found myself saying lockdowns are a luxury of the affluent. And I was um, essentially. Uh, echoing all the things that have been already said by Martin and Jay, but also thinking very much of uh, other countries where lockdowns are simply not an option. So I guess my bottom line is I don't even care whether they work or not. I do, of course, but, you know, I, even if someone, if there was now very good proof that they worked, and we should actually qualify that word worked, what does worked mean? suppressing infection okay so what if they suppress infection i mean again go if we go back actually go back drill down to that a bit further what are lockdowns for lockdowns could either keep the infection in which is what they used to do in medieval times during the plague is okay we the villagers would agree we're not we're not going to let anyone out and that was a noble a noble use of lockdown and you could argue that that's what Wuhan actually, that was their purpose, at least declared purpose at the time. And indeed, even Bergamo, it was all about keeping it in, which one can understand as a strategy, even if it's not realistic. 
Then, of course, there are countries who have used lockdown to keep it out. And you could argue they've been successful, New Zealand. In certain circumstances, you can keep it out. It's an entirely selfish strategy, but it, it can work. But we're talking about lockdown suppressing infection. And you have to ask, even if it does work, first of all, to what end? And I guess the only um, answer to that that might be reasonable is until we get a vaccine. But that's a big gamble. So that's a debate that needs to be had. But then the real issue is, even if they do work, can we afford them? And the answer, I think, is no, not in the UK. Maybe there are some very rich, very affluent countries where the wealth is distributed evenly, um, uh, who have money in the bank. Maybe Norway can say, well, we'll stay in lockdown until we have a vaccine. Um, but as such, I don't think lockdowns are an option. Uh, they're only an option for the affluent, within any most settings. And for most countries, they're simply not an option at all. And the sad truth is that even focus protection is not an option for many countries on this planet. And we should be aware of that when we um, think about this problem. So those are, those are all great points. Uh, certainly one of the um, one of the criticisms I've had from the lockdowns from the beginning, and I think, uh, Sunitra has really touched on this, is it's never really been clear what the lockdowns were trying to accomplish. I think when, when Canada went into lockdown in the, the latter part of March, almost exactly a year ago, nobody was quite sure why. There was, a, there was an atmosphere of panic, but I think the, the prevailing perception was we were doing this so we could get our healthcare system in order so we did not face the problems that they had in Northern Italy. Now, there were all kinds of reasons why, why Bergamo and Northern Italy had the problems it had, and there were lessons to be learned, and they were learned very quickly. And it was pretty obvious by within a two or three weeks that our healthcare system was, was actually empty. It wasn't being overwhelmed uh, by COVID, but the, 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 uh, the goals and objectives of lockdown, which had never, as I said, had never been clearly stated here, or I don't think anywhere else, sort of morphed. There was this, this sense of mission creep. And, and it then went, well, we're going to do this because we're going to prevent deaths. And, and of course, it didn't work terribly well with that. But by, by the fall, it had morphed even further. And it continues to morph into now we're going to prevent cases. We're going to not zero COVID or, or, or very little COVID or stop the waves, as some people have called it in Canada. So the objectives of, 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 of lockdown keep changing. And you know, there's that great public health doctor, Yogi Berra, who once said, if you don't know where you're going, you won't know where you when you get there, and we certainly don't know when we're getting there uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of lockdowns. So underlying the, uh, the principle of lockdown is, is another hugely controversial area, and I think an area of great science, of significant scientific uncertainty uh, with regard to COVID, and that is the issue of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. And uh, so much of the, of the rationale for the lockdown measures is based on the presumption that these are important engines of transmission, that we can't simply avoid the symptomatic people. We can't use what would be more typical means of, of controlling the disease because of the importance of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission, which I think undoubtedly happened. But that's not really the point. The point is how important are they in the overall transmission uh, of, the, of the virus? Would any of you like to weigh in on that? Sure. Um, there was a fantastic study published in the Journal of American Medical Association earlier this year uh, that was essentially a meta-analysis of, of transmission uh, within a household setting. You know, you, so your, 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 your kid gets the disease or your, your wife gets the disease What's the likelihood that the disease, that the infection then spreads to other members of the household? So it's a, it's a kind of a controlled setting, right? Generally with no, uh, no, no social distancing, no mass, no, no, nothing like that. Uh, and it was a large meta-analysis of, I think like 54 some studies. Um, they they compared pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic 
transmission on the one hand versus symptomatic transmission on the other hand. And what they found was that if you have a, a household member who is asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, the disease is spread to other household members set in seven out of 1,000 cases, seven out of 1,000, versus if you have a symptomatic patient, the disease is spread in 200 out of 1,000 cases on that order. Uh, the, the likelihood of transmission, asymptomatic transmission, uh, relative to symptomatic transmission is orders of magnitude lower. It's, it, it, as you say, it can happen, but it is not the primary, uh, it, it primarily is, is very unlikely to happen. Any given interaction between an asymptomatic individual and, and an and a, and a, and a immune naive individual is much, much, much less likely to result in a transmission than a, a interaction between a symptomatic individual and, a, and, a, and, a, and another individual. Um, so uh, if that's the case, um, that, I mean, in household settings, it seems like it's, like, you know, it's going to be much more likely, even more so in outside settings, because in outside settings, people are social distancing, right? Even, even, in, even in, in, um, in places that don't mandate it, you've seen social distancing. Um, this spreads by droplets, it spreads by, uh, by um, aerosol, but aerosolization events are more likely for someone that's symptomatic. Droplets are more likely, infected droplets are more likely for someone that's symptomatic. Um, so I think both from a sort of physiological uh, point of view, as well as the, the sort of the, the evidence on the ground, asymptomatic spread can happen, but should not be the primary driver for our thinking about how to control this disease. Okay. Anyone else? Well, for the people who are aiming for zero COVID, of course, whether it's asymptomatic or symptomatic it is, uh, transmission uh, matters. But uh, zero COVID is uh, impossible. Uh, so the question is, what strategy do we use? And it doesn't really matter whether there's uh, asymptom the amount of asymptomatic versus symptomatic spread. In either case, focus protection is the right approach where we protect those who are at high risk or mortality. Um, and uh, to uh, try to uh, prevent it from spreading among asymptomatic people who have no symptoms or anything uh, is not useful for public health and is more likely to be as harmful. Sanitra? Um, yeah, so I would say overall and one of the, I think, um, uh, strengths of the solution of focus protection is that uh, some of these questions they i mean it's robust to the answer that we might have obtained uh, with regard to what we should actually do but in terms of public health recommendations uh, obviously this shows the importance of staying at home when you're sick how much more important that is to um altering the course of the disease or whatever it is that you're again trying to actually do if you want to stop it from spreading or if you want to stop it from spreading to somebody in particular vulnerable person for example it's it's particularly important to uh, for a symptomatic person not to engage in activities that could ensure that or that would um, uh, promote that so I think what it does is it just shifts your perspective from, you know, what would you focus on in terms of preventing the spread in situations where you need to prevent the spread. Now, overall, I would say we don't really need to prevent the spread. We need to prevent, protect the vulnerable while spread is naturally occurring. So in some ways, it's not a, a very critical question in terms of how we protect the vulnerable. But I think it obviously has other epidemiological um, relevances and uh, which we've, we've already talked about. Yeah, it, it certainly is, is important for the issue of, of quarantine. We, we've, we call that self-isolation now. Uh, isolation, of course, is what you do to cases, not what you do to contacts. But we, we call it self-isolation, but it's really quarantine and it's been very widely applied around the world for contacts, for travelers, for whatever. And of course, it's based on the notion, presumably, that you are some risk to others when you are asymptomatic. It's 
I'm sure been an immensely inefficient. I, I haven't seen any good data on, on the proportion of different kinds of contacts who ended up eventually developing the disease. But I, one, of the, one of the knocks on quarantine, of course, is that it's immensely, immensely inefficient. And in fact, if, if pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread are, are not a major feature, they're not a major risk, then it's also in fact entirely unnecessary. What you should do is observe people and if they become symptomatic, then you should, then you should, uh, you should isolate them. There's a very good reason why successful respiratory viruses make us cough and sneeze. It's not because they wanna make us miserable, it's because that's how they spread efficiently, I think. Well, coming back to something I alluded to a few minutes ago, which is the, the, uh, the models. Um, one of the points that I made with SARS some 18 years ago and uh, at the time was that we spent all of our time worrying about what SARS might do rather than actually looking at what it was doing. And it, with, with, with the first SARS, we missed the boat entirely because it in fact was not a highly infectious disease. And it was only spread in people who were critically ill and primarily in hospitals. And the minute we started taking proper care of people in hospitals and proper infection control, SARS essentially disappeared. And in spite of the fact that there were models at the time that were predicting 120 million deaths from SARS, we ended up with, I think about 800. But models, in fact, have, have played a huge role in, in, in our response uh, to COVID um, and, and uh, for reasons that, that I'm, I, I've, I've, I, I still scratch my head because, you know, a model is like the guy who predicts the football game or, or picks stocks. And when they start getting the answers right, you start paying attention to them, but they have to get a few right before you pay attention to them. And when they're always wrong, after a while, you just tune out and go somewhere else. But they have taken on a role of their own. So I wonder if maybe you could reflect on why you think we have become so enamored uh, with the models and why you think so many of the models have been so consistently wrong. <laughs> Should I start? Please, please. Okay, well, I, I think, and I've been um, trying to quietly, quietly say this, and actually kind of gave up after a bit uh, for the last 20 years of that uh, or more, that models are fantastic conceptual tools. Almost all of my thinking um, in this case, for this pandemic and everything else that I've done in my career has been guided by models, mathematical models, and they give wonderful insights. For example, actually, the fact that the loss of immunity, the rapid loss of immunity doesn't actually impact on the maintenance of herd immunity is something that I would certainly have found hard to understand without the aid of a model. Um, I've used a mathematical model to generate a flu vaccine. So, you know, I have huge trust and faith in models, not just in advancing um, our conceptual understanding, but in the ability of these concepts to be translated directly into public health outcomes. So what is my problem with predictive models? Predictive models require us to make assumptions about the parameters and the processes of, of the models, within the models, but particularly let's dwell on the parameters, um, which are very difficult to nail. So. The reason, I mean, there was no difference between Neil Ferguson's model, really. It was big, large computer simulation and a paper that we put on MedArchive uh, around the same time, last year about this time, um, which it, the difference was that our conceptual model just told, gave you an idea of what the various extreme, I mean, what the scenarios were that were compatible with the data that we had and pointed to what data needed to be collected in order to discriminate between the different possibilities. What the other form predictive modeling does by contrast, is you take a model, often a complicated one, and you try and use statistical methods to fit it to such data as are available at that time. And that means you come up with a sort of the, your best guess. And each time what you're doing is making some sort of guess, which 
you know, you, you use statistical mo- um, methods to try and dignify, but at the end of the day, uh, they're not very accurate, they're not very reliable by, I mean, perforce, because they rely on an accurate measurement, really, and an accurate guess, even a Bayesian one, at what the parameter is. And often the outcome is so sensitive to that parameter. For example, how many people are going to die when they're infected, that it just becomes a nonsensical exercise. And then you end up making, uh, doing things to the model that should never be done. So you make an assumption about how much transmissibility will be reduced by closing schools. And then you run the model and you say, this is what, how much infections will drop. Because you've made an assumption that transmissibility will be altered by closing schools. So, I mean, at that point, it just becomes not a very useful tool, shall we say. And I think that's, but as I started to see 20, 25 years ago, there was this problem, which is that um, there's a seduction to um, numbers and equations, or, or they can frighten people, they, they intimidate people. So once you see some equations and graphs, um, it's very easy to believe that this is the truth. Uh, and I think that it's our responsibility as modelers to make sure that people are aware that that, that that's not the truth, that is a projection. And of course you can have um, make an educated guess or have your favorite projection or say, this is what I think is going to happen. But it's, um, it, it is unfortunate that, that those projections and predictions have in some ways taken the place of mathematical modeling. Well, I, I apologize, I did, I, sorry. Go ahead, Martin. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And just as an example, if we take the Imperial College model that Neil Ferguson and others worked on, they assumed that the infection fatality rate would be, uh, I think, around 1%. So that's the, the, uh, the percent of people who get infected that will actually die. Uh, so that was one of the input parameters. And at the time, uh, it was uh, not known what that infection fatality rate was. So that was one plausible thing, but it could be something else. So uh, they developed this very fancy uh, uh, computational simulation models to then get out how many people would die. But I could have done this uh, with that uh, 1% and then an assumption on uh, a few other assumptions that they made. I could have made the same conclusions from uh, some hand calculation on the back of the envelope. But because it's a sort of a complex, sophisticated system, that becomes like a black box, then people have more confidence in it. Uh, although me, as, as somebody who's been worked a lot with models, uh, I have less confidence in it in that case. Now, if, if instead you have assumed the 2% infect, uh, so the 1% infection fatal rate meant that the estimate for the US was I think about 2 million deaths. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if we instead had put in 2%, it would have been uh, twice that approximately, so 4 million deaths, but if we had put in uh, uh, a tenth of a percent, it would be much less. So this uh, system is very, very, as, as uh, Dr. Gupta said, is very, very dependent on the input parameters that we don't really know. And that makes these uh, complex, uh, sophisticated computer models uh, useless for public health purposes. Can I, can I, can I address that for just very briefly, uh, just to, to give a sense of the uh, I mean, I, I completely agree with both of my colleagues. I mean, I, th- I think the, the, it's, the, they can be useful in helping you think about things, trade-offs, but they not, should not be used as gospel truth because they rely on so many assumptions. But I, I, what I want to address is um, things that we end up missing because we're beguiled by the complexity of the model we have. Because real, the reality is much more complex than any model we can ever, ever devise. And just let me give you a, a concrete manifestation of that in the context of lockdown. And so in the United States, um, the, uh, the uh, hospitals are staffed by people that, that, are, that, that are in the labor force, as you, you'd expect. When schools got closed in the United States, a large number of women 
uh, stopped working to, to, to care for their kids at home, to oversee the instruction for online instruction. They withdrew from the labor force. At this point, actually, the, the, the female labor force supply in the United States is, is, is at the lowest level it's been since in 40 years. Um, that had a knock-on effect of making staffing at hospitals more difficult. And it actually made the ability, the, 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 the likelihood of hospitals being overrun by COVID patients or other patients more likely because it reduced the staffing levels at hospitals. I didn't see that in any of the models because no one, no one had thought about the knock-on effects of the lock -on, lockdowns of, of closing schools on the labor force supply. Um, that's not, they're not in, it's not in the Ferguson model. It's not in any of these models that we see on the internet. It's just a, but it's a fact that has happened in the real world. Uh, if you act on models without a broader wisdom about how these interact, these interventions will, will play out in the rules, you're going to get these sort of unintended con consequences um, that make the, the goals you're trying to achieve, whatever they are, more difficult, as well as cause other, all kinds of other harm. Okay, thank you. And I, I think the uh, uh, Sunitra, I apologize. I wasn't, I wasn't dissing models and modelers. I was simply, uh, well, of course not. Like no reflecting on the, the role they're playing in public policy. And I think we all agree that they should not be the drivers of public policy uh, that they have so, uh, so uncritically become. So let, let, me, let me pivot and, and turn to another issue. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to talk about this, but I want to talk a little bit about masks. Uh, I was struck when, when you, uh, you did your interview with, uh, with uh, Unheard, when you, uh, you announced the Great Barrington Declaration, that the three of you were, were sitting side by side at a table and none of you were wearing masks. And I, I wondered if, if that was a, a statement or whether it just never occurred to anybody that that was the, the, the politically correct thing to do. But just as, as lockdowns kind of swept the globe in, in a matter of a couple of weeks, uh, we went from being generally very skeptical about the use of, of, of public use of masks in, 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 ca in casual social situations uh, based on, I think, many years of experience and, and a not inconsiderable body of evidence. And then in the course of, of about a month in, in, uh, in April and into May of last year, uh, the world pivoted 100, 180 degrees and became very enthusiastic about mask use and masks have become, masks have become kind of the, the emblem of, of COVID control and people I think sometimes wear them as much to, con as much to show where their, their minds are at and whose side they're on as, as opposed to uh, just, just to prevent disease. But what, what, are your, what, are, what are your feelings about masks? Do you think masks play a role in COVID control? What do you think that role is? Uh, what do you think about mandatory mask laws? Well, one concern is that uh, uh, with the public health messages that have been sent out that masks uh, are critical, uh, and even the former CDC director in the US claimed that masks were, were more important than vaccines, uh, which is of course nonsense. But uh, that means that a lot of older people think that as long as everybody wear masks, they are protected being outside going to the supermarket and so on. Uh, and the concern there is that because they think they are protected when they are not, they need to physically distance to protect themselves. Um, they would take risks that they probably shouldn't have taken. Uh, so that's the concern that if you, if you make people think that these masks are going to protect you, but they don't, that's a problem with the older people who needs to be protected. Jay or Sunitra, do you want to weigh in on this delicate subject? I, I think, um, I mean, I think, in, I mean, I agree with Martin, obviously, uh, on that. He's, I mean, it's very, it's, it's, it, but it, what it points to is a failure in public health messaging around masks. I think that with any intervention, we should think about both, both the costs and the benefits and try to think broadly about what the, what the, what the effects are likely to be, right? So, um, my problem with the mask, I mean, I don't, I don't just, I don't think that, uh, that they're useless. I mean, I think in, in like in hospital settings, they're quite useful. Uh, in other, in, in crowded so, in situations where it's very difficult to, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, social distance, they might be useful. The, 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 the empirical evidence in my reading is very, very weak on the subject. So I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other in that sense, because it's just, the, it's just, it's hard to evaluate based on the, uh, so I don't, I'm puzzled by the, 
by the uh, the lashing onto it as if it were a strong thing. I mean, like as Martin said, the the uh, the idea that the CDC director would say that they're more effective than vaccines just still boggles my mind. Um, I, th I think that what what's uh, the other problem with masks at least the messaging around them is this created this moralization of behavior that I think public health should seek to avoid. You know, if I wear a mask, I'm a good person. If I don't wear a mask, I'm a bad person, right? Um, I, I think that that has created social division where, where public health should seek to create unity. Um, in, in, in a sense, it's, it's a cousin of how we've moralized, public health messaging has moralized COVID. The first, person, first question someone asks when someone gets COVID is, well, who gave it to you? Where'd you get it from? Why weren't you, why weren't you protecting yourself? We stigmatize COVID as if it were a, a, you know, a, you're now a pariah because you had it. Again, a failure of public health. Um, I, th I think that the, the, the major problem in public health messaging, it's like every single, every single pathology you could imagine in public health messaging has happened with COVID. And masks are just sort of the tip of the, tip of the spear of this, uh, where we've created something that could be useful in some settings if we were to convey the information properly and, and treat the public like adults and say, here's where the evidence is strong, here's where the evidence is weak. Instead, we've turned this into this moral mo uh, moral thing you can do to, to, uh, to, to, to signal virtue about yourself. I think that's just an enormous mistake. Cindy Truck? Um, yes, I mean, once again, it's, it's all down to the framework of cost and benefit. And one, I mean, I have largely been indifferent to masks in the, because you think there is, very little cost, mostly. Um, so in which case, you know, it should be up to the individual. But the truth is, as my colleagues have just outlined, that that's not um, correct. There are some costs. First of all, the idea of masking children, I think it is, to me, makes me feel um, slightly sick, a uh, bit of my stomach, because I just think that masking individuals I mean, it, it has must have some mental, quite serious mental health consequences. The idea of putting a mask on a child is um, is really problematic um, for me. Um, masks, of course, create the illusion of protection, which can be uh, difficult if if that and, and dangerous actually, as has been mentioned, and also masks have been used to um, buttress the idea that this is a, the, all of this prevention of infection is a communitarian activity, which is problematic because um, it's not actually. The lockdowns and all these measures are in fact at some level highly individualistic acts and people should at least be aware of that. I mean, uh, to, to believe that you're performing or participating in something that's communitarian when in fact you are individualistically protecting your own affluent community is to me um, a bit of a problem. So as such, while masks may seem to have no cost uh, and where they don't, I think they, they should could and should be used if it in fact gives the, the wearer a sense of um, security or um, and maybe, you know, if you're visiting a vulnerable person, why not take that extra precaution just in case? So I think it's just, uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted that there are no costs associated with this intervention. You know, just reflect on that as a, as a public health doctor. <clears throat> in public health, we often make recommendations to the public that are in, 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 in contrast to medical type interventions, they seem sort of small. Um, they're, they're, you know, exercise more or, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables. They, they don't, it's not like cutting off someone's leg or putting them on a toxic drug. And we, we tend to be a little casual about them. Uh, and, and the strategy is, you know, if you can make a small change in the lives of lots of people, you can actually have a significant beneficial public health impact, but the flip side applies too. I mean, masks are not without their harms. They are an imposition on the lives of people. They're uncomfortable. They reduce our social interactions. They, they I think, spread fear among children. And although you may say, well, that's a, that's a pretty small harm, when you, when you multiply that across billions of people, the cumulative harm is, is, is not so small. 
and particularly since it's not clear what the end point is going to be. Again, it's like with every aspect of lockdown, it's not clear to me once we, once we start wearing masks, it's not clear when we stop because if we wait until there's no more COVID, then people are going to be wearing masks or at least some people are going to be wearing masks for, for a very long time. And I, I think, we, I think we, uh, we pay a price for that. Turning to public health messaging, one of the things that has, has shocked me from very early on has been public health willingness to resort to fear as a, as, a, as a legitimate tool to promote public health policy. And I know I've heard Martin and Jay both speak on this and how this is contrary, and I completely agree, contrary to the basic principles of public health, which are, are much more about giving people common and, 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 and uh, objective information to assist them in making, making rational decisions. But, but fear has become a big, a big element. I, I think. I think there are many, many people who are, are deeply fearful, often irrationally and unrealistically fearful, of of, of COVID. I want to know if you agree with those statements, and and if maybe you can talk about how we can move forward because people who are fearful don't make rational decisions. So, who'd like to weigh in there? I, I can take a stab at this. I mean, I, I think um, it, it helps to try to understand why it's a bad idea to induce fear as a public health strategy. Um, I, I think there's lots of reasons, uh, but like for, for one, and you, you, you said one of the things I completely agree with, um, it's, it is, it is, it's hard, it, it's uh, very difficult to unring the bell. Once you've triggered fear as a, as a response, to assu assuage someone that, like tell people really here's what the data actually saying is not enough. Because they won't believe you. Their 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 people's fear takes over their willingness to listen, and, and it creates this division that lasts. Um, in, when the fear ultimately dissipates, I think it creates distrust that's very very long lasting. It'll be much more difficult to uh, give people good public health messages about a whole host of other things that are are even more work, are even more threatening to their their health than. Than COVID, you know, advice about diabetes management, advice about cancer, cancer screening, advice about uh, about uh, a whole host of public health priorities are going to be much more difficult going forward. Vaccinations, um, because of co because of the 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 use of fear as a tactic to control people's behavior um, it, it, by public health, it just it, it undermines trust in public health. Um, I think if I mean I could go on at length of this, but I think that the the um, uh, pu the public health community is going to need to think very carefully about this, uh, about how to undo the damage. And it may be, it may be, it'll take quite a long time to do that uh, when, when, when we're, we're finally through COVID. I mean, that, this is one of these things where I thought was a basic principle of public health that everyone agreed with. And yet we almost immediately resorted to this fear tactic. Uh, and it's, and even for COVID, it hasn't worked, right? The idea is like, we have to get people to do, to understand, to take it seriously. But what's happened then is that uh, we, we've conveyed this idea that COVID has this flat age profile and risk. And so what, uh, so in, to some extent, people who are older have underestimated their risk, whereas people who are younger have overestimated their risk and, and, and have undertaken activities that, uh, actions that have actually harmed them out of that excessive fear of COVID. Um, it's not possible to engineer the population to do exactly what you want them to do. Like it's better to treat people like adults. As public health, we have to treat people like adults, give people facts in a, in a, in a, in a clear, meaningful way and give them tools so that they can flourish. I mean, that's the purpose of public health, not to induce panic and fear, which is the way we sort of address this epidemic. Martin? Uh, I agree with that. Uh, uh, so I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> Sinitra, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, again, I'm, I'm not a public health person. So, um, yeah, it just does seem to me that using fear as a tactic is, uh, it's, it's, well, it's, it's a real insult to the general public that we should even consider such a means as if, you know, I mean, I've often been told, well, you can't, you shouldn't be talking about uh, more optimistic projections because then people won't they won't take it seriously and my answer has always been 
the general public are able to, they are equipped to understand the, the, this problem. It's not, it's not like, um, you know, it's not quantum physics. The fact that an infection spreads and as it spreads, uh, people become immune, which impedes the, the progress of the, um, of the pathogen through the population. These are not concepts that uh, the general public wouldn't understand, wouldn't be able to take on board. I mean, this discussion, what have we discussed here that is not, that someone won't, comp a general, some, a member of the general public would not comprehend? So why this disdain for the general public? And yeah, if, uh, if public health officials, it's a two-way street. So if public health officials do not trust the public, then automatically the public is never going to trust public health officials. So that trust has to be in both directions for it to work. Yeah, I mean, reflecting on my own career as a public health uh, physician, when I retired, I was often asked to reflect back on what, what the, the big battles had been. And without hesitation, I would identify the fight against tobacco addiction as the dominant issue of my 30 years in public health. And I think we all understand that although we've made a lot of progress, particularly in, in North America, uh, tobacco addiction as a public health problem still dwarfs anything that COVID-19 has come close to doing. And in Canada, we have an estimated 40,000 deaths a year as a consequence of, of tobacco addiction. And, and those deaths, each one represents about 20 years of potential life loss. So as, a, as an impact on premature mortality, it's six, eight times greater than what we've seen. Even in Britain, tobacco addiction has, has, uh, is, has caused a much bigger impact on premature mortality than, than, than COVID has in the last year. And of course, tobacco addiction uh, deaths go on year after year after year. But the point is, is that many years ago, we learned that promoting fear was not a very useful tactic in, 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 uh, in uh, controlling people's tobacco use, that that was not a, that was not a very effective strategy. And we, and we moved away from that to things that, that were, 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 as I say, much more balanced, much more rational. We didn't try to scare people. Uh, we tried to give them the facts. And, 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 and I think also when we use public policy, um, we, we did use public policy and have used public policy, but it's not been coercive public policy. I mean, why people said, oh, why don't you just make tobacco illegal? Well, you don't do it because, because it's a free and open society and because that won't work. When you start using coercive measures, sooner or later, people will push back as they push back with, with, uh, with alcohol prohibition. So I, I completely agree that it's contrary to, to the, the, the principles and in fact, the experience of, of public health. Kind of a spin-off of that, though, and I, I think it's a spin-off of that, is, is we're hearing now a lot about vaccine hesitancy when it comes to COVID. And there seems to be significant reluctance, particularly among some segments of society, to, to, to get the vaccine. And just to give you a little background um, on, on, on vaccine hesitancy in Ontario, uh, in Ontario, for 35 years, we've had uh, uh, something called the Immunization of School Pupils Act, which is often characterized as a mandatory school immunization law. In fact, it's not that. There's no, there's the, what, what it, it does is it gives parents options. They can either present a record of immunization or they can get an exemption. And there's something, there are medical exemptions if you're allergic to a component or if you previously had the disease. Uh, and, and then there's what's called a philosophical exemption where all you, all you have to do actually is, is sign a piece of paper saying I'm philosophically opposed to immunization. The point is that since the law was, was put in place 35 years ago, the, the percentage of children who have been exempted is, has been about the same. It's been about 2%. It's been very small and it's varied a little bit between philosophical and medical exemption. But uh, as of the last time I checked, which is admittedly is three or four years ago, it was still running at where it had always run at about 2%. So the reality is in spite of all of the, the talk about, about people in general being hesitant about, about immunization, that really wasn't reflected in the numbers. And parents with a little nudge, 
were, were, were by and large very willing uh, to get their children immunized. So I don't see vaccine hesitancy as a sort of a, a fundamental problem in our society. And yet we seem to be seeing a lot of it uh, with, uh, with, uh, with COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, would anyone like to talk about, about why that's happening? And again, what we can do to overcome that? I think it has to do with the trust and because of the mismanagement of the pandemic, there's much less trust in public health officials uh, in CDC in the United States and so on. So then when the same people say we need to have a vaccine and it's going to be mandated, um, then people don't trust it. And if you try to coerce people into that, with, for example, vaccine passports, that, uh, that backfires. Uh, it, re it reduces, it increases hesitancy in, in uh, and uh, reduces uh, willingness to get vaccinated. And the problem is it's not just because of the COVID-19, it also spills over to other vaccines, uh, incredibly important vaccines like measles vaccines in children or for example, polio vaccines. So in, in my view, I mean, there's a small group uh, of, of, uh, of people who don't want, uh, who don't believe in vaccines and often called anti-vaxxers. But that's a very small group. And as you say, I don't think they have been very influential. But uh, these people who are not pushing for vaccine passports uh, for COVID, they are doing a lot more damage to vaccinations uh, than uh, these anti-vaccine people has ever been able to do. And one example is uh, 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 people want to mandate those who have had the disease to also get a vaccine. But uh, they don't, people who have had the inf infection naturally do not need the vaccines. So when public health officials are saying those things, which are obviously nonsense, then obviously people are going to say, well, I can't trust you. Why should I get the vaccine at all? So uh, I think uh, these people who think that they are promoting vaccines by arguing for vaccine passports uh, and mandatory vac vaccinations of COVID, they are doing a huge public health damage, both to the willingness to get the COVID vaccines, but also other vaccines. And they are the, at this point of time, they are the big anti-vaxxers uh, because of what they're doing. Anyone else? I mean, I, that's, I, that, that's completely right. I mean, the, 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 the vaccine passport idea or, or the, the idea that you have to require uh, the vaccine to participate in normal life in a, in a sense it's like a it, it, uh, in the United States the, 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 in, the, in the south we had this segregation between blacks and whites for a generation called the Jim Crow laws right so this is this is like a reimposition of Jim Crow in with the vaccine as the division in society uh, the vaccine hesitancy the the, the the public research suggests that it's is actually is quite divided uh, 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 along Along uh, socioeconomic lines, where the where it's it, where whereby it's the it's it, it, it's like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, minorities that are more more hesitant than than um, the poorer the more hesitant uh, you know people who have reason to distrust public health are more hesitant and if we then say you can't participate in normal life unless you've done this we've essentially reimposed a sort of vaccine Jim Crow uh, I, I think it's a, a, a deadly public health disaster instead tell people about how effective the vaccines are, for, especially for older people, it's a, it's a godsend, as we said in the beginning of, of this. I mean, it, it, uh, it really does reduce the, the, the risk of being exposed to a deadly disease for, for someone older. We should be conveying this as a, as a, as a you know, ju just show people the data, convey it to them in a form that they can understand and tell them the truth and people will respond, I think. Mm -hmm. Sanitra, do you wanna weigh in on this? Um, yeah, just to say that I think that vaccines are distorting perception of risk. So if we were straight up and just said, look, you know, again, if we followed the focus protection um, sort of framework, we'd say, these are people who are really at risk. They really need the vaccine. And once we've given it to them, we can um, relax at some level. Then that would be a nice message. It would be truthful and it would make people more positive about the vaccine. But instead, if it's being uh, if we're being told that, in, particularly in the UK, that we nothing is going to change until we vaccinate everybody, um, this creates, I think, 
a perception of risk which will be somewhat at odds to what will either first it will either heighten a sense of fear heighten the fear or it will seem wrong to someone who goes and we now Oxford someone I can't remember which group at Oxford University has produced this nice little app that you can use to calculate your own risk and mostly you look at that risk and then you think why are they asking me to, to telling me I have to be vaccinated I think you can set up all sorts of um, conflicts and uh, questions in the minds of the thinking public and I consider most of the public to be um, thinking or capable of thinking and so I, th I think it's 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 really um, unfortunate that we haven't just said, this is a fantastic tool for focus protection. This is going to liberate everybody. Let's use it to that capacity. And then, yeah, sure, if you're worried about getting long COVID and you want the vaccine, go for it. You know, that's fine. But it's the way it's being um, presented or how the plans for its use um, don't align with the science and, and I think will cause more confusion and hesitancy. Yeah, there, there are some interesting parallels with the influenza immunization and actually that's particularly relevant to the province of Ontario, which for the last 20 years has been a very, enthousi very enthusiastically embraced the policy of universal uh, influenza immunization. It's been really a major government policy. And it's one that I, I actually initially supported. I wrote the editorial in the Canadian Medical Association Journal almost 20 years ago saying, what a good idea. And then about five years ago, I kind of changed my mind. And, and it's interesting because even within Canada, the two other large provinces, so Quebec and, and British Columbia, don't have universal programs and in fact have been very resistant. Quebec has actually increased its recommended age from 65 to 75. And, and the issues are very similar. I mean, influenza vaccine has the additional problem that it's not as good a vaccine, but the issues are very similar. And, and, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the real issue is uh, with COVID is what are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to limit death, well, then you, you promote vaccine in, in the vulnerable. And if a vulnerable person doesn't want to take the vaccine and they die, well, it's a free and open society and, and, that, and that's your decision. And young people, well, yeah, they are not, not at zero risk. So if they wish to do it or if they think it's socially responsible to do it, but obviously the urgency or the, the importance of getting immunization in younger people is not as strong. I think that's what uh, Colvinder got in trouble with with the college for, for expressing sentiments pretty much exactly along, along those lines. Lines. But again, if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to be sure where when you get there. And if we keep changing the goalposts, if I can mix my metaphors, keep changing the goalposts, uh, then then in fact we, we will never get there. So that's so. Let, let me let me ask the, the the next question: Is where do you think we are headed with all of this? And and you know, by way of background, I'm I'm an incorrigible optimist. Last spring, when people were saying this is terrible, I said, no, wait. Once people realize that the outbreaks in Western Europe have peaked at about an order of magnitude less mortality than the models predicted, people will come to their senses. Well, that, that didn't happen. They didn't come to their senses. And then they said, oh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna contact trace. I said, don't worry. As soon as those strategies collapse and they lasted about 15 minutes in Canada before they they collapse people will realize that that, that that's not an option and then and then I said don't worry as soon as they realize that lockdown is not a short-term phenomenon they'll realize it's unsupportable that's not going to change it didn't happen and then I said don't worry when the vaccines come along it will all change and this will all go away well Clearly, that's not happening. The vaccines are here and the rhetoric is getting shriller. And I know I have some colleagues who, who, who think this is actually getting darker and darker in terms of the, uh, the infringement on, 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 on individual rights, on, on, the, on the stigmatization. And, and I keep trying to be an optimist, but, but ironically, I find it harder and harder to be optimistic. Well, what do you think? Uh, I am an optimist. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of people who have dug their heels in and they're not going to change their views. But uh, within the population, there are more and more people who are understanding what's going on, who are learning about uh, infectious disease technology, uh, 
and who are seeing that it's obvious that lockdowns and contact tracing are not working. So I think that's a gradual process, but that makes me optimistic because I think during the, the one, people were a year ago, people didn't know anything about these things. But as people learn more and more, there are more and more people who are realizing that the path we are taking has been a huge mistake. And I think that's gonna increase uh, the number of people who come to that realization. So I think that uh, that's, uh, so I'm optimistic for that reason. Um, I am uh, pessimistic in some ways. Uh, for example, I'm pessimistic. It's gonna take a long time as, as Dr. Barashaya was saying to, uh, uh, to re regain the trust between public and public health. Uh, that's a huge uh, <clears throat> undertaking that we have to take to, to regain that trust. And it's going to take many, many years to regain that. We have all the collateral damage from public health from the lockdowns that we have to deal with for many, many years. So in that sense, I'm not very optimistic. Uh, uh, and, uh, and also in terms of the scientific community, where we have seen so much uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 limit scientific discourse, either by ignoring uh, people or by slander and so on. And a lot of people who don't dare to speak up. Uh, I don't know if the scientific community is gonna survive that. Uh, uh, I, I hope it will be able to regain because if not, then, then the 300 years of enlightenment have ended now. And that would be very unfortunate, I think. Uh, in the short term, uh, in terms of what I think is the priority to do next uh, is to make sure that all children get back in school for in-person teaching. If there's one thing I, I could change uh, is that uh, uh, all children are back with in-person teaching uh, by Monday. Uh, it's so important for children. Uh, no, no schools district should... Uh, uh, there's no public health reasons to keep uh, children away from schools and there's enormous damage both short term and long term so no school district should prevent children from uh, going to school and no, no parents should uh, try to keep their uh, children away from school and there is a change there uh, at least in the United States where there are parents uh, as well as some teachers are really rising up to demand that uh, schools reopen. So this is gradually happening, but it's way too slow. Okay, anybody else? Grounds for optimism, pessimism, what do you think? I think salvation when it comes will come from the people. I mean, if you look at Germany is a good example of this, right? So uh, Angela Merkel did a, uh, had, a, had a, uh, a renouncement that she was going to close the country entirely. Grocery stores, a, a very sharp, sharp lockdown uh, from April 1st to April 6th. Um, and an enormous number of people protested because it's an inhuman thing to do to prevent people from, uh, from and that wouldn't even be effective on, 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 on stopping COVID because, you know, if, you're, if, I, if you tell me a week from now, I'm not going to be able to shop for, for, for food for my family for a week. I'm, I mean, we're going to crowd the grocery stores from now until, until then, right? Um, spreading the disease. I, I think uh, I agree with Martin, the, the people who have been arguing, who stake their professional reputations on lockdowns, the scientists and, and, and so forth, will be the very last people to change their mind. And, and I don't think that that's really where the, where the, ch the change will come. In the United States, the, 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 the lifting of lockdowns has happened because of political pressure on governors. And, and, uh, and I think in Canada as well, that's what it's going to take. It's not going to come from experts. Sunitra? So I haven't lost my optimism, but I have become disillusioned in certain regards. Um, so, sir, I mean, I would say the biggest point of um, uh, surprise and, and horror for me is how we've treated school children. I just didn't think that was possible. I really did not imagine that the general public would permit such a thing to happen as to prevent school children from being in school. Um, and also the blindness displayed towards the collateral damage, I found very, very surprising. So, I mean, there are many points, in which, no, then of course the censure of my colleagues and the, the, the ways in which the mainstream media have behaved. Um, all of these things have come as 
huge surprises to me. Uh, but I still remain optimistic that eventually there will be a sufficient kind of wash of opinion. Uh, people will return to their senses, I hope. Um, and at least the space for public debate will again be open. Well, and that leads nicely into my next question, which is, is why, why has there been such vitriol, so much rancor? Um, you know, I, I think back to debates of previous years, I think back to SARS, which was, it was a big deal in Toronto. We, we had a, we had a, a in hindsight, we thought it was a major outbreak. It was not a major outbreak, but it, it seemed like it at the time. And there was a great deal of concern, a great deal of worry. And there were there were divided opinions. And and my views were 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 outliers. I think they they sub I think they eventually turned out to be correct, but they were outliers. But I was still able to meet and discuss and exchange ideas in a collegial fashion. With uh, with my colleagues, even though we were we were poles apart on this, we could still laugh and joke and and make uh, make side bets and and do the usual things that that colleagues do and and uh, and and that that free and open exchange of ideas was important. With COVID, from the very beginning, it it seemed to be different. On on uh, the very beginning, uh, back in March, when uh, when one of our, our local modelers, who I'd always regarded as a, a friend and a colleague, uh, went to the media with the results of his models, and I sent him an email just saying, "Hey, uh, heads up! Don't you remember we had this discussion ten years ago with your model on?" H1N1 that was wrong by three orders of magnitude, don't you think you should be a little cautious with these numbers? And instead of engaging me in discussion, he fired back an email accusing me of being in the pay of the capitalists. And I thought, whoa, where, where did that come from? Like, and, 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 and so it's, it's, it's the, it's the rancor, it's the political divide. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm, I'm reading too much into it. In fact, I think some of you have commented on them. On it. The three of you cover a broad uh, political spectrum. I think Sinitra has been quoted as describing herself as, as left of labor, which is probably more or less where I'd put myself. And, and I know Jay has worked for the Hoover Institute, which I, I doubt is named after the vacuum cleaner company. So you've managed to, to, to overcome this. But in the world, both the scientific world and the political world, you're either on the side of, 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 of the orthodox or you're some kind of libertarian, conspiracy theorist, anti-vaxxer, climate change denier. Why has this happened? Where did we lose the collegiality? How can we get it back? Well, you didn't mention my politics, but in my native Sweden, because I support the socialist government's policies, uh, of uh, keeping schools open. So there I'm a, a left-wing fanatic. And in the US, I, I support uh, focus protection of the Florida government, etc. So here I'm a, a, a right-winger. So I guess uh, I'm a schizophrenic in my politics because uh, I have two countries where, where the different sides, uh, in Sweden is the left who is uh, 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 in favor of uh, uh, trying to keep the society open and against the lockdowns and uh, the right is sort of want to have more lockdowns but uh, in the US is sort of the flipped the other way around so I guess that that makes it uh, sort of very uh, schizophrenic for me ha having two countries like that. So how have you dealt with that as a group? How have you, I mean is that an issue? For if if Sunetra is left of center, count me as left of center, left of labor. I'm, I, I also am endorsing <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, that what I've discovered is that there are values that, that are more fundamental than, than partisan politics that divide us. Um, I mean, I, I find much more in common with my colleagues here, all, all the folks here. And I honestly don't know what your, I didn't know about your politics, Richard, before, before you just mentioned, it. you know, I, I think there's this like this, uh, commitment to, to small l liberalism of of of, uh, of, of sort of a, a vision of society that sees uh sees the the purpose of public health as 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 promoting human flourishing protection of, of life um and that uh, but, but consistent with democratic values i mean i think all of those things are things we all share 
that are much more fundamental than any whatever partisan uh, issues that that, that, that that divide us. I think if, can I make a comment on, on like I, I mean I try, I've been trying to think about what the answer to your question is why we have this divide. Um, and I don't know if I have a full answer, but I'll say I've noticed, I know that there's two norms and two very, very different norms in scientific discussion versus public health discussion. In scientific discussion, I view science as this is a dialectical process, right? You have an idea, I have an idea, they, they make different predictions, we, we, we look, do the experiment, the experiment favors you, I say, yeah, you're right, Richard, and I, and I we, we make a side bet, and you won the side bet, I take you to dinner, right? Um, and then we make, then we have another disagreement, we keep going. It's really, it's a fun process of disagreement resolved by uh, data that we look at together and, and argue over. I mean, it's, it's it, and there's the, the one thing that can't happen in the process is I, you can't stop me from having an idea that disagrees with you. That, that discussion, that open discussion is absolutely fundamental. That's part of the norm of scientific discussion. Right? When, when Martin says that the age of enlightenment has ended, that's what I take him to mean, right? That, that, that discussion, that openness discussion ending is the end of science. On the other hand, in public health, there actually does have to be some consistency in messaging, right? So you can't really have a lot of, a ton of like deep disagreements played out in front of the public because you'll confuse the public, right? So there's this norm of like, Let's agree on what we're going to say, and then we agree. We when we when we communicate with the public, we communicate as close to a consensus as we can get, so as to not, you know, sort of give conflicting messages. So there's there's a little less of that norm of completely open discussion. There's this this, this norm of like consensus building before communication. The the problem here is that we have this this situation that's really novel, right? We have a virus. We don't know what the infection fatality rate is. We don't we don't know a lot, a lot of basic facts about it in March of last year or February of last year. Um, and strangely, instead of letting the scientific process and debate get carried out before we arrive at a consensus, we said we decided we knew the consensus. We knew all the results, uh, and anyone that would argue against the consensus uh, in doing normal science is dangerous. I think it's the conflation of these two norms that, uh, especially with the premature application of the sort of public health norm for consensus that has that has led to the problem that, that we're seeing here. Uh, I, I don't full, I have a full answer to your question as to why. Maybe, maybe people thought of this as too important, or maybe it's just fear took over even in the minds of public health and scientists. Um, but in any case, I think that's that's what's going on. So do you try? So I, I th see this as a collapse in the the space in which people think you know it's, it's a collapse in dimensions everything suddenly collapsed down it must have been fear and uncertainty that collapsed everything down to a single axis so normally you think oh well you know so and so has these views i really agree with those but then that particular idea i don't i don't believe in free markets as much as i think markets should be regulated but it's never a sort of he this person is evil because I think markets should be regulated, but he or she doesn't. So I think that's led to what I call a very big middle term non-distributed fallacy. So that, you know, people are looking to take all these different ideas and usually you were able to think of an individual as having this idea, that idea, some of which aligned with you, you know, a big sort of space in which their ideas um, existed and sometimes contradicted each other, sometimes complemented each other, and that's all gone. So now it's sort of like, uh, well, you believe in focus protection, Trump believes in focus protection, so you must be, you believe in Trump. So that sort of fundamental sort of um, syllogistic um, problem, I think, has flourished and, and become accepted. So that I think that's what the Enlightenment militated against, is let's not think, let's not commit those fallacies. Uh, and somehow we've gone back to thinking in those fallacies. Uh, and that's what's uh, led to this kind of tribalism. And when that happened, what Sunetta describes, that means we are, science becomes more religion than science because you, you belong to a certain groups so who have to, to sort of uh, believe in a, a, a set of uh, beliefs. And uh, you can't have that attitude uh, uh, in, in science. Uh, so, so I think that's why if that continues, then we, we, then we don't have a bright future for, for science.
Well, there's so much more I would like to talk about, but I, I promised Colvinder uh, 10 minutes at the end. I think she wants to ask us a question and to, uh, and to sum up. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity to thank the three of you. It's, it's been wonderful. I've, I've just, been, just been a delight for me and it's great to meet you. And again, thank you for all the great work you've done. Colvinder. Thank you, Dr. Shavis, um, oh, for- Well, Vinder, I have a hard stop in three minutes, but- you know. Yes, um, thank you all um, uh, uh, tremendously for sharing your insightful and informed uh, um, opinions and, and for sharing your wisdom and for your expertise. Ontario and Canada's response um, over the past year has been tremendously myopic, very misguided and um, fear-based as, as, as and we have discussed. And most frontline physicians here in Canada are hopeful that your discussion will bring the data and the science back to the forefront to allow for our policy decision makers to start making ethical evidence-based decisions. Now, going forward, um, what is one thing that all of you um, think should be done to ensure that we're never in this situation, in this predicament, uh, um, again, in the future? Can I quickly answer and then I'm going to have to go? I'm afraid. I, I think we need to take full stock of the collateral effects of um, the mitigation strategies that have been put in place. So at the very least, at a very fundamental level, we can do a cost-benefit analysis right at the outset. It seems to have been left for the end, like, okay, we'll, we'll figure this out when, when we get to the end of this process and that, and that is simply wrong and we're going to be paying for that for decades so i would that's one thing that i would like and in fact many of us are actively engaged in um, promoting that particular activity which is to have a very clear look and a clear tabulation um, of what these lockdown strategies have cost us. Thank you. Oh, uh, so in the, uh, in the immediate thing, the, the most important thing is to get all schools and school children and students uh, back in school with in-person te teaching immediately. We can't afford to have any more uh, uh, suffering and uh, treating those children and students the way we have done uh, uh, for no good reason. Uh, 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 that in terms of the long term, we have to go back to the basic principles of public health that was thrown out the window a year ago. Uh, it's not one disease, public health is about all diseases, so all the collateral damage. We can't just think short term, we have to think long term. Uh, public health is about everybody in society. We can't protect the, the laptop class or the Zoom class and uh, throw the working class under the bus. Uh, uh, the issue of uh, fear, we can't use fear and shaming as a public health tool. Uh, it has to be trust between uh, uh, public health uh, officials and the public, uh, and so on. There, there are many of these other principles that we have to uh, also adhere to. Also, for example, uh, somebody who is sick is somebody who has symptoms. Somebody who has a case is somebody who has symptoms. Somebody who is asymptomatic is not a case of a disease. Uh, we have to listen to, as public health uh, officials, we have to, we can't assume that everybody's like we are. We have to listen very closely to the public. And, and also one basic principle of public health uh, is that we have to reach everybody. So I've been criticized for being on, uh, on certain media, which is either left or right, because I've been on both. But we have to, in public health, you have to reach everybody. So you can't sort of only decide I'm only going to reach Democrats or only reach Republicans. You have to reach everybody in public health. So there are many of these principles that uh, are fundamental to uh, a good public health uh, uh, strategy and the public health of the, of the population that we have ignored during this last year. And we have to get back into those, uh, those basic principles of public health. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Bhattacharya? I mean, I mean, I'll really just endorse what both uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Kolder just said. I mean, I, I, but let me just, and I just, maybe I've had one thing to add uh, is when these decisions got made in March, a very, very narrow set of experts 
raised the alarm and were incredibly influential. Um, we have to set up processes where if we're gonna consider something like this again, a much broader set of experts need to be at the table, right? It just can't be mathematical modelers or whoever it was. It has to be people who understand the broad, the breadth, the full breadth of public health uh, at the table when these decisions get made. Uh, and voices that urge for caution should not be uh, set aside and ignored, even demonized, but rather welcomed so that we can have an open discussion in full in the full eye of the public, so that we can uh, so that they can make up their own, own minds as well as to the wisdom of these kinds of actions. Um, what we've done now is is essentially override that debate, force the public with a with a policy as if there were no other choice, and then withhold from the public the the fact that a very large number of experts disagree with what's going on. Um, it's it's anti democratic and is likely to lead to uh, enormous harm in the in the in the intermediate and long term. Um, so, I think what it, I, I I would like to work for uh, to, toward that vision of expanding the, 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 the debate at the, at the highest levels to include more people uh, and more viewpoints before we ever do anything like this again. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Shavis? Well, of course, like the other uh, panelists, I could talk about this for several hours, but, but uh, I, I, think, I think probably the biggest mistake and what we, we need to change, it's something that, that actually comes out of the, the Intelligence Committee. Uh, when you read about, about failures of intelligence, probably the most spectacular being the weapons of mass destruction fiasco, the lesson that they were supposed to have learned from that and maybe have learned is that you need to encourage cognitive dissonance. You need to encourage critical thinking. You need to have people who are looking at things differently than your, your, your mainstream view because it will help to prevent you from making catastrophic errors. It will help to keep you honest. And we've done exactly the opposite. Instead of encouraging uh, critical thinking, uh, different ideas, we've stifled it. That's what makes the actions of the Ontario College of Physicians and Surgeons towards you so, so shocking, uh, because it, it's absolutely the opposite of what we need to do. And it's been that absence of, 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 of critical thinking, of incorporating critical thinking in our decision making that has led to one mistake after another in, the, in, in handling COVID-19. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you all for um, uh, uh, being on a uh, Concerned Ontario Doctors panel and, and, and uh, Dr. Shabas uh, for moderating. Um, uh, this has been tremendous and I really hope that this will um, be a pivotal point um, uh, within um, uh, Canada's response um, to COVID-19. And um, I would uh, ask all those that are watching to continue to um, follow Concerned Ontario Doctors advocacy closely. You can follow us on on, on our website, um, carenotcuts.ca, which has the links to all of our social media. And thank you once again um, um, for your tremendous insights. And uh, I, I, I truly hope that um, science and um, ethics and um, evidence-based decision-making um, is back to the forefront very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure thank to you. both.